to the Real Estate Investing Made Simple podcast. I'm your host, Bailey Kramer, and today we are joined by our very special guest, George Abreu, to talk about apartment renovations. George has been investing in real estate for over 14 years. He started with single families and small multifamily properties and has done everything from wholesaling, fix and flip, and development projects. George is the CEO of Elevate Commercial Investment Group and also owns a construction company called JNT Construction. Welcome to the show, George. Thank you. I'm excited to be on. Yeah, absolutely. Super excited to hop into the apartment renovation talk. I know it's something that a lot of my listeners have been wondering about, a lot of questions to be answered. Before we hop in, though, why don't you go ahead and give a quick background about yourself and tell us how you got here. Sure. Um, I mean, you gave a, a pretty good intro there, but uh, I can go in a little bit deeper. You know, I, uh, I've, I was studying to be an electrical engineer is how this kind of started. And, um, you know, I, I just had this uh, urge that I wanted to start my own business. I wasn't sure what it was. Um, so I started doing some, some reading and looking into successful individuals um, and real estate investing kept coming up. So I got um, drawn to that and started digging in more and more. Finally, uh, started doing some deals. By that time, you know, I had graduated and I was working at UPS in their engineering department. Um, finally, did enough deals to to quit my W two. Started doing real estate full time. That was we're getting close to about fifteen years ago now. I think. Um, started with the single family. Um, started doing a lot of fix and flips, and that's when I decided to open the construction company to help scale that. Um, that's 11 years ago now, roughly, um, when I, when I opened the construction company, learned a, a lot with that. Um, and then about four years ago, decided to kind of, um, move everything over to, to large syndication, multifamily deals. Um, I just felt, uh, more passionate about those deals and, um, that's where I'm at now, you know, close to should be at right about 2000 doors um, in a week or so. And then um, wanting to continue to build. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that story. And I think it's super relatable. Everyone, not everybody, but a lot of our listeners, they kind of start out similar to how you did. You know, what can I get into? Uh, I'm entrepreneurial. I don't really know what to do. That's what happened to me and real estate just keeps popping up, keeps popping up. So that's super unique. And then pivoting too was a huge part of your journey. I can tell from the fix and flips, you said you did wholesale and you keep pivoting, which is just awesome and finding and doing what you're most passionate about. And I know something that you focus on a lot. Like you said, you have a construction company, you do a lot of the renovation side. So that's kind of what I want to hammer in on this episode. So starting with the due diligence process, can you kind of explain to our listeners what the due diligence process is and how that kind of leads up to the renovation and capex side yeah definitely i mean so the when you go into a a psa purchase sale agreement you know you should have a due diligence period within that and um usually your deposit money won't become hard till that period is over um some of the hotter markets, that's not the case. Your, <laughs> your deposit becomes hard day one. Um, however, that's what it's um, meant to be. And it's uh, meant to be a, a time where you can dig into, uh, essentially it's kind of two part, you know, you can dig into the financials and the leases and kind of verify everything you can on that end. And then also, then there's the building part of it you know, and, and, um, what you're actually the condition of, of the building, the deferred maintenance and those things. Um, so on the physical part of it and, and, and the building part, you know, I, I feel like that's where we're, we really excel with, um, the construction experience. We go in and and we get very detailed. We want to know exactly what we're buying. We want to know, you know, exactly what our CapEx budget's going to be, um, including the upgrades. So we, you know, a lot of investors kind of just look at the deferred maintenance during due diligence, but I mean, we look at the full picture, you know, we want to know 
what upgrades we're going to do as well. If we're going to add an amenity, you know, what that's going to cost us. Um, if we're going to upgrade the leasing office, we take all that into account. Um, short timeline and we kind of squeeze it all in um, as long as you schedule everything appropriately. Um, it's definitely doable. Um, you know, we've got a lot of systems and, and softwares in place that help us do that. Um, but yeah, so essentially the, the, the due diligence is the part where you get to, so at the end, you know, before it ends, then you want to take all that information. And if you discover some red flags, um, that's the time to bring it up to the seller. And if you need to retrade or ask for, you know, ask for a discount on the price, uh, that's the time to do it. If you need to walk because what you've discovered is just too much, right? Then that's the time to walk. Um, so it's, it's a very important um, period in the transaction. Right. And I think that the due diligence period, or even just the thought about the concept of due diligence scares a lot of investors, whether it's people who want to do fix and flips, single family, multifamily, because something that people don't know too much about, including myself, is the renovation side of things. So for anybody, whether it's someone getting into fix and flip, whether it's someone getting into single family, multifamily, whatever the case may be, and they, they know that they have to do some renovations and they want to scope that out a little bit in the due diligence period, how do you recommend someone go going about that if they don't have much experience? Yeah, I mean, there's diff different ways you can look at it. Look, if... if um... If you're getting into this and you're kind of putting together some partners or a partnership or a co-GP, you know, I think it's a good idea to bring someone in that has that experience um, on the actual GP side. If that's not an option, then I highly suggest hiring somebody that is experienced, has a track record, um, you know, knows multifamily. I want to stress that because whole different uh, monster compared to single family and um, uh, yeah you just need to make sure that they're focused and and experienced in the multifamily industry um, and then don't just 100% count on, on them to to take care of it too you know be be involved uh, begin to learn um, and yeah okay awesome yeah I mean that that word leverage is such a powerful word and it applies to so many different aspects, but kind of what you touched on is leveraging other people's knowledge. And I think that's huge for something like, like um, renovations. Having someone who has that knowledge is definitely a, a huge part of it. Another thing I was curious about was the underwriting portion. The under, when, you, when you're underwriting a deal and you're looking at some pictures and this is the initial stages and you, you're looking at them, it, they're, some, you know, the kitchen's looking rough, maybe the outside's looking kind of rough. From the initial estimation point, how do you go about estimating rehab on just the initial look at the deal? Um, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I, I get pretty detailed on that end, um, especially if I know it's going to be competitive um, as far as my offer price is going to have to be competitive. Um, there's several questions that I, I asked the broker and the seller a lot about the CapEx that's been done and, um, the actual status of units that gives me a really good idea. Um, I then take that information plus the pictures, like you said, you know, pictures can tell you a lot. Um, Google maps can tell you a lot. Um, you know, there's some features on there that, that even show you past pictures and, and you can compare and see what's been done. Um, I put that all together and I, and I put it into a spreadsheet that's got some uh, pricing from uh, our database and that spits out a pretty rough but educated number. Okay, gotcha. And, and in that formula and in your process, I know that there's a class apartments and I know there's D class apartments. So when you're figuring out what finishes to use, what's the best way to know what's appropriate for that apartment complex? The comps. I mean, you want to see what you're, you know, if you're targeting to get the rent at, at this apartment, okay, well, what do the units look like? 
Um, you need to get a clear picture of that. And then you got to, at the minimum, match it. You know, if, if you feel like you can throw in something a little bit extra, um, then yeah, go ahead. Don't, don't overdo it. Right. And, and yeah. from the comps, do you mean by just looking at pictures, do you go to the other properties and do some mis uh, secret shopping? Do you have any, uh, do you have any certain strategies for knowing what the comps actually look like? Yeah. On, um, you know, where, where you're talking about is, is sounds like it's high level, you know, before you, you really go in deep. So at that point it would just be pictures. But I mean, once we decide to, to tour the property and start digging in, then yeah, secret shop for sure. You have to. Right. Right. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. That's I think something uh, to, to newbies. And when I was first learning, when I first heard the secret shop of going to other apartment complexes, pretending like maybe you want to be a renter and kind of being able to scope out, ask them questions, see the units. I think that's a huge uh, advantage that you could have if when, when you do that. Yeah. Especially if you're going out of town um, to visit the property, like make the most out of that trip. You know, you, you definitely got to get out. Right. There. Right. And, and just know, you know, the ins and outs, every, every opportunity, um, what the market's looking like. So that's, that's a great tip. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the due diligence process. I know there's a ton more that goes into it, but for time's sake, we're going to go on to the CapEx side and when you're actually ready to do those renovations. So I know you, um, have the, you have your own construction company, but most investors that I've meet don't have that construction component to it. So most people hire out a third party like yourself to go in and perform these renovations. So can you kind of touch on how that looks like for the owner, what's involved and, and kind of how, how you guys go about that? Yeah. Um, you know, I guess I'll go more into like, if I was, if I didn't have the construction company in right. house, um, uh, you know, the first thing I would want to do is, and this is before even closing, is have a clear scope of work. You know, know exactly what you're going to take care of on the deferred maintenance and know what upgrade you're going to do. Um, you know, that should be a decision um, with the ownership. And, you know, you can take suggestions from, from your contractor. Um, but it shouldn't be something that's left up solely to the contractor. Um, right. and, and, and I do see that sometimes where the investors are kind of just like, Oh, I don't know, like <laughs> <laughs> do whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so have a clear scope of work is one, um, then decide who you're going, how you're going to handle it. You know, is it gonna, are you going to hire a GC to take care of all of it? And if, if you are, you know, realize that you're trusting that company um, with a large project and make sure you do your homework, make sure you check their track record, their references, ask a lot of questions as far as their process. You know, how, how is this going to work? How do you, how do you handle change orders? How do you update me? Do you update me daily, weekly? Um, do you use a software? Um, you know, am I going to have a full-time project manager? Um, I'll tell you this. Project managers determine a lot on the outcome of a project. Um, so you could have a, a construction company that looks good on paper and the owner is amazing. Right. Um, but if for some reason they don't put a good project manager on there, it, it's not going to go smooth. And are you um, able to vet that, pro that project manager beforehand? Is that usually available to owners or do they normally just meet other people in that company? Um, I mean, you can ask anything as a, as a right. potential client. I mean, I, I suggest you do ask those type of questions. Like, like I said, you know, are you going to have a full-time project manager? And then you can follow up that, follow that up with, if they tell you yes, then, um, well, can you give me, you know, his resume or, or his track record? Um, I think that's, that's great. It's a great question. Um, so determining that, you know, and if you, if you're not going to go the GC route and, and you're going to try to go straight to the subcontractors on everything, um, yeah, maybe you think you're going to save some money, but <laughs> who's going to manage that? And do they have the experience to manage that? 
you know, I see a lot of um, investors counting on their their property management companies to to handle that. Nothing against that. I work with a ton of project ma um, property management companies. Just same thing. Ask questions. You know, who's who's going to manage it? Um, is it just going to be the head maintenance guy? Do you have um, somebody that specifically does capex and are they going to be my point of contact? Same thing, you know, how are they going to update me, etc. Um, and then if you have somebody on the team that's going to do it, do they have the credentials to do it? <laughs> right, right. So it sounds like that experience, that knowledge, that dedication to the job is something that's yeah. super important to at least figure out and know if that person has, you know, that experience and has the right credentials to be able to handle the job. Is yeah. there any? Look, it's a, it's a lot of money, you know. These yeah. capex projects we're talking about million plus. Um, you want to make sure it gets done correctly, that it gets done, period, <laughs> um, and quickly. And um, you know, the, the the business business plan counts a lot on the capex. Right. So when you're talking to these contractors, let's just say you already picked one out already. At what point do they come? into the deal with you is it due diligence when they're able to check everything out is it after the deal closes when when do the contractors get involved with the owner or with the new owner yeah i mean i i suggest during due diligence for sure um the earlier the better uh if not due diligence i would say definitely before closing you know get that scope of work figure out what that scope of work is going to be and then um bring that contractor in uh, you know, we like doing pre-construction meetings before, preferably before the, the, the deal closes. If not, you know, maybe the same week or, or two after it closes, we have a pre-construction meeting, get everybody on the same page and then uh, kick it off. Gotcha. And once that's kicked off and, you know, the construction's in full swing, what do the owners of the property typically do? How are they involved in the process? You know, it, it, it depends. Um, I've seen it all over the place. I, I do. I can make a, a suggestion. Um, yeah, please. <laughs> you know, there should be one individual on the ownership side that is in charge of the CapEx. And, and they should be the voice of ownership. Um, you don't want to be sending different messages and, and making it more complicated for the contractor like you want to work with the contractor and and work as a team so i i do suggest that you know have have that one individual even if they if you don't have a lot of experience still you know that's going to be their responsibility their role um not that the other individuals can't be on the meetings or, or whatever but just that the message is coming from that that one person Right. And keeping that clear stream of communication and not, you know, 10 different people trying to talk about the same yeah. project. Yeah. And then right. um, that makes a lot of sense, you know, and to have uh, a clear picture of who's who's going to be approving the work and who's going to be um, punch list, you know, who, who's who's the one in charge of, of actually walking in and doing the final punch list. Um, yeah. Right. And as far as the materials go, because I know that when you're renovating apartment complexes, whether it's 20 units, 100 units, there's a lot of materials that go into it, especially when you're doing floors or kitchens, whatever it may be. Who typically is responsible for ordering the materials? Is that typically that one owner that you'd like to delegate or is that more on the um, general contractor side of things? I mean, you can go either either way, you know, it depends how, how hands off you want to be. Um, as the contractor, I'd prefer doing it myself um, as far as ordering the materials because I have more control of, of the schedule that way. Um, I think the design part should definitely come from ownership and, and um, a lot of the times I kind of see that you know, nobody wants to own it and it's kind of not, not really <laughs> thought about and um, it, it can hold up projects, you know, it can. Um, so, yeah, I do suggest either having someone on your team that, that that's going to pick things out or hiring a, a designer 
to come in and, and pick it out. Awesome. And I know you already named a bunch of things, but if you can give one or two or a handful of red, uh, r- green lights and red lights, things that you should look for that you want to be popping out of a property, uh, out of a general contractor or construction company, and then a few red flags that if they pop up, you kind of want to put your hands up and walk away. What, what would you say? Um, yeah, I guess let me start from the beginning kind of, you know, if, um, if you get a contractor out there and they're, they go through, uh, hopefully you have some type of scope or, or an idea of what you want to do. And then they get you an estimate and it's not very detailed and it's maybe a, a paragraph and then this big number, um, huge red flag, huge, like the scope of work should be very detailed. You should know exactly what you're getting um, from the contractor. Um, you know, another red flag I can think of is um, uh, online presence. You know, if, if you try searching for reviews and just the company in general online and they've got nothing <laughs> um, <laughs> or negative stuff, then um, yeah like that that's a red flag um and then maybe if you start asking them about more detailed questions about their processes and they can't give you straight answers um not a good sign right um you know as far as green lights everything i just said if they <laughs> if they do have those things, right, right, then that that's good. You know, if they give you a detailed scope of work, if you check them online and they look great, um, if you ask them about their their processes and they spit it right out and they show you, um, you know, we usually send screenshots of of our project management software and we kind of show them, look, this is how we communicate. This is what you see. Here's an example. Right. Um, then yeah. Okay. Awesome. Is there any, I know we can talk about, you know, construction contractors for days and days, but is there any last big things you want to tell the listeners, whether it's about general contractors, due diligence, and any, any other main parts you want to talk about? Um, you know, d- due diligence, I would say just, just make sure you, you put the time and, and, and work into it, um, that you hire who you need to hire. Um, you know, if you've got to spend some extra money to make sure you know what you're getting, spend the extra money, you know, get your, your sewer line scoped. Um, make sure you know exactly what you're purchasing. Um, on, on the contractor side, you know, um, or just in general on the CapEx side, make sure that you've got a plan and that you got somebody that that um, is responsible for it and and, and uh, can handle it. Um, the last thing you want to do is, is fail with your capex and then have it hurt your returns and your business plan. Right, right. Something I kind of heard as a theme between the due diligence and the construction side, like you were saying, was don't cut corners just to save costs because kind of mentioned it before it's going to come back and bite you after whether it's, you know, you don't want to f- scope the pipes or maybe you don't want to hire a GC. You want to hire a sub. Those things seem like it's going to come back and end up costing you more money. Yeah. I mean, look, unless, unless you've got a, a stud on your team that, that, that's got the experience and he's got the systems and, and, and he's done this before. Um, then yeah, I mean, spend the extra money. Trust me on the, in the long run, it's going to, it's going to pay off. Um, it's not worth trying to save thousands to possibly lose investors money. Or, right. Yeah. For sure. And that's, that's, that's the big thing. You're the fiduciary to the investor's money. And obviously no one wants to lose an investor's money. So no, that's why I'm so thankful you shared these valuable tips because these are things that can save people a lot of headaches, a lot of money, a lot of time. So thank you for that. Yep. So we're now going to move on to the next section of our show, which is the big four, where we ask all of our guests the same four questions. So George, number one, what's your number one habit for success? Number one habit for success. 
Um, man, I'd have to say. Uh, oh, that's a tough one. Number one. Um, you know, staying focused and and um, I think make staying focused and and making sure that I'm man managing my time correctly, that I'm spending the time on things that I should be spending um, versus getting distracted, um, which kind of leads back to the focus. So, yeah. Right. And are there any tools you use or any books that inspired you to keep that focus? Um, you know, traction. I don't know if you can see it there in the back. That, that, that was a good one that kind of... Um, at the time I read that book, I was spread really thin and trying to focus on way too many different, <laughs> you know, I had the single family within the single family. I had a lot of different things going on. Then I had the multifamily and, um, yeah. So yeah. I think that one helped. Yeah. Awesome. Question number two, limiting beliefs are thoughts in our heads that hold us back from realizing our potential. What is one limiting belief that you were able to crush and how did that impact your life? Hmm. Yeah. Limiting beliefs. Um, they're rough. <laughs> yeah. We gotta, uh, we've always got to be aware of what we're telling ourselves. Um, you know, I think one that helped with multifamily um, was I had never raised equity before for a deal. You know, we, in the single family, we just had a couple private lenders and right. I'm sure at some point, you know, we had to obviously convince them to partner with us and, um, but a whole different ball game on the, the raising of the equity. And just, um, I guess I had this mindset that, um, individuals don't really like talking about their financials and, and, um, their finances, uh, net worth, liquidity, those right. kind of things. Um, and I think once I broke that barrier and realized that it was just a, it wasn't accurate, um, it helped to start um, really knowing what investors were, were needing and, and how I could help them. Right, right. That's a great point. Thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Question number three. What advice would you give to someone who is looking to invest actively or passively in real estate for the first time? Actively or passively. Um, yeah, you can take that whichever way you'd like. Yeah, I feel like the, the, that's two different uh, questions yeah. there. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go with the passively, uh, stop thinking about it and do it. <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> um, obviously take your time on on who you do it with and, and the deal and a lot of due diligence with, within that. Um, but to kind of also go over to the active is, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not easy. Um, th there's a lot, a lot of work that goes into it, especially if it's something you want to do full time. Um, it's not easy. You, you're going to put a lot of work into it. Right. Awesome. All right. And number four, what is your favorite real estate business or personal development related book? Business or personal development? Um, I guess I kind of answered business already with, with, with traction. Yep. Um, you know, that, that book helped me a lot with being able to manage different companies. And um, like I mentioned before, focusing on what I needed to focus on. Um, personal development. Um, Man, there's a lot of good ones out there. Um, uh, you know, you can't hurt me. Um, is a good one just because um, I had read quite a bit of personal development books before I read that one, or actually listened to it. Um, and I suggest listening to that one. It, it's got some good stuff in there. Um, it just it took me like next level. Like okay, um, you know it. it the things that he went through um, and conquered just made some of the things that I was trying to conquer seem like nothing. So right, yeah. So that's you. You can't hurt me. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And then the final thing is, George, where can the listeners get a hold of you? Um, 
you know, we're constantly updating our website. If you go to Elevate CIG, stands for Commercial Investment Group. So ElevateCIG.com, you can see a bunch of the free content we have and podcast interviews like this one that I've done <clears throat> on different topics. And um, they can also feel free to send me an email at George, J-O-R-G-E, at ElevateCIG.com. Um, I can send them over. You know, I've got some due diligence checklists and awesome. other things I can send them. Fantastic. Well, George, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's a pleasure having you on. I learned a ton about, you know, the due diligence, who to hire, when to hire. And I know the listeners got a ton of value out of it too. So thanks again, George. Thank you.